knocked down three planes. Eight missions you were lucky, 10 somebody up there like you, 25 was almost an impossibility. The plane blew up and I got knocked out. Welcome to Air Combat Journal. Today's journal entry is from World War II B-24 and B-17 radio operator, Big Jim Everhart. This is your pilot, John Sermon, asking you to sit tight and strap in. Air Combat Journal is ready for takeoff. Well, my name is James Edward Everhart, and they call me Jim. All Jameses are called Jim. Uh, my crew position was a radio operator and gunner, waste gunner on the B-24 and some on the B-17. Okay. I was a tech sergeant. The responsibilities of the B-24 and B-17 radio operator. As I've told lots of them, I don't know what I've done. I think I was supposed to monitor the radio and copy down message I heard and uh, send position reports at certain times when the navigator would tell us where we was at. Uh, when the bombs was dropped, I think my job was to decode and send a strike report, whether it's good, fair, excellent, or whatever. And just monitor is all I know. And we had one job that I do remember was sewing out shaft. That was that strips of tin foil. You carried in the radio room. We had a little trap door out the side of the trap uh, airplane. And at a certain point, usually close to the IP, uh, all radio operators threw out shaft. And while the flak was popping, you just have your head down and putting the shaft out the window and out the door, and it was little packages of it that would come apart and little strips of tin foil fly through there. They told me to mess up the German radar and every airplane was doing it. And it had you busy while the flak was popping and uh, you just kept your mind off everything. I used to take my flak suit and I'd really slip around and take the flak suit off the side of the radio and set it, sit on it because I, I figured that might help something coming straight up and throw that flak out and listen to it and uh, listen to the flak, I'll throw that shaft out and listen to the flak busting and that was about it because I hadn't had that experience of hearing that till this museum over here and seeing that film over in the museum at Savannah over here, they, when they listened to that flak and closing my eyes and all of a sudden they simulated opening the Bombay doors and that rush of cold air coming in. It did bring back memories. That's about all I remember the radio operator done. Never had to fire a gun at anybody. We never were attacked in the whole 30 missions. Fighter planes never attacked us. So I never fired a gun at any, never fired a gun at anybody. Jim describes flak. It's hard to simulate the sound of flak. Uh, I hadn't heard any of it till I went to see the show, The Memphis Bell, and they had tremendous sound of flak, the sound of the B-17 engines, and that was the first time I'd heard it, or heard anybody imitate it uh, since World War II, and then I heard it again in the museum, and I don't know how to, to describe the sound of it, just like I can't describe the sound of the buzz bomb. I want somebody to to send me, and I think Eric Swain is going to send me a cassette tape of the buzz bomb sound over. I know how it sounds. I, I can't hear anybody imitate it. Morse code versus voice transmission. I've done Morse code as far as uh, communicating with anybody outside the plane, although inside the plane you had your throat mics and you had intercom systems. But all of my communications from the radio operator's standpoint was Morse code and uh, the pilot did all the voice uh, talking except one time when I was <clears throat> on that special job of a uh, relay ship during the month of December 1944 when I had all channels and I, was, I would act as any station, any Air Force plane was calling and couldn't reach his people he's calling, then I would may like I was him, and of course I'd say, this is relay, I'll relay your message, and I did a little voice in, but my pilot did most of it. 
So others, I would just, uh, just Morse code was my way of communicating with someone outside the plane. Jim recalls a typical mission day. I can reminisce about okay. how you would, uh, just uh, a 19 year old boy like me that was raised up on a textile mill village in South Carolina. Uh, dirt streets and didn't know anything. Went to high school, but I never had anything much, so I, would, I might have been called a hick, I guess what you'd call it, but never had anything. So when I got in the Army and they told me I was in the Army Air Corps and went through all the trainings and ended up being a uh, radio operator on a B-24. Uh, prior to that, they wanted me to stay at Miami Beach as a drill instructor, I guess because of my voice. I don't know what it was. But I wouldn't do it. I wanted to fly, although I weighed uh, 190 pounds, but I didn't have any of this pot. I was real slim, but I weighed a lot. But anyway, I got on the B-24, and that's what I trained on in Mountain Home, Idaho. And when I got overseas, a typical mission I can remember is going out at night where you find out where those English pubs were, drinking that mild and bitters, and pouring it in you, and come by the order the room and see the, it had a little white flag, I believe it'd be pulled up if you didn't have any mission schedule. And you'd say, well, I'll go home and sleep. And it'd be about 10, 11 o'clock and lay down in your bunk. And sometime during that period of 11 o'clock till two, some brass would decide we was going on a mission and they'd pull up the red flag, so to speak. And just as you'd get to sleep with your belly full of mild and bitters, Somebody, especially the radio operator and engineer on the crew, had they were responsible for getting everybody on that crew up. They would shake you and say, you're going on a mission. That'd be at 2 o'clock or 2.30 or something that in the morning. So you'd get up, don't make up any beds, because you don't know where you're coming back or not. Uh, go out in no uh, darkness, because it was wartime and didn't have any lights on, but you could learn to see a little bit with your eyes, and you knew where the mess hall was at. Stagger across the field, cussing the Germans about getting you up in the morning. You know how it is when somebody wakes you up and you don't want to get up, you take it out on anybody. <laughs> and get to the mess hall, and I heard a documentary the other day, they said they found you, fed you powdered eggs, but they fed us fresh eggs. Uh, just go through the line, get what you wanted, fry them the way you want them, get the stuff and just eat. Eat in a hurry, come out, and uh, I guess it was what a condemned man's meal. You get your last meal because you might not come back. Well, I didn't even realize that being just 19 years old. That nothing's going to hurt you. When you're 19, you're immortal, you know. And get on an old truck, uh, ride around, and you knew where the briefing room was at. Get off of the truck, go in the enlisted man's quarters, then come out, pull back the curtain. You had your red line showing where you're going, going and they'd explain to you about staying awake, <laughs> wearing your, tying your shoes to your belt, which was uh, just left them back in England. Why don't you just carry them GI shoes tied to your belt? You wasn't going to jump out no way. And they used to say, well, if you ever jump out when you open that chute and that quick stop and your sheepskin boots will fly off and you get down to Germany on that snow and ice, and you wish you had your brogans with you, but I don't guess I even realized it was, I wasn't gonna have to jump out. So after you get through briefing, you come out of the briefing room, go out and there'd be an old truck with a step up on it. You step up on it, they'd take you to the parachute room and you get your parachute and I'd get my code books and put on a heated suit, still a, maybe a cussing every once in a while. You know, mad at everybody. Just thought you was a big shot when you was using that profanity which ain't good. And then come back out and get on another truck that's always going around the perimeter track. You knew where your airplane was at and pull up and get off. Get in that airplane, you had a certain spot to go. Now on the B-24, I stayed on from up until the 490th went in B-17s in about late July, early August of 1944. I'd go in the back of the airplane through the bomb bay and my radio spot, I'd lay my parachute down right at my waist gun when I get in, just a little chute pack, lay it down the floor, go through the bomb bay, and 
sit down at the radio room, get all my radio equipment, check it out, and just maybe sit there. And the pilot and them be coming in, I'd maybe fill out the Form 1 for them. I got where I knew everybody's serial number, name, rank, and serial number. And I'd fill it out, to have it ready for them, just sitting there at my table and get ready to take off, and that was my takeoff position, just sitting behind the co-pilot. And I used to look right over the co-pilot's left shoulder. The engineer stood right beside me. The pilot was on the left-hand seat, and you could see all the way out to the end of the runway, way off now, just breaking day. And I could see it from my seat, and right in front of me, I sat back of him, I sat sideways in the plane, take off sideways. And I could look out a little window about, oh, 10 or 12 inches round, like a little porthole, and I could see the right landing gear of that B-24. And we'd start down that runway, and you could see the end of the runway way down there, and I'd hear the pilot and the co-pilot going through their procedures. I didn't know what it meant, but I knew that they did. And all of a sudden, you'd get to going, and the end of the runway would be coming, and before you know it, the front end of the airplane would, you couldn't see out there. You couldn't see the end of the runway. It done got in behind that. Of course, you still had lots of runway to go, but you couldn't see it from where I was sitting. You was looking over the top of that top bar, nose turret. And I'd get to wonder if that thing was gonna take off and the pilot talking and both of them would have their hands on the throttle and full throttle and just that plane just a wobbling going down. And I'd look out at that right landing gear and it was a big, uh, where it's stretching out trying to get off the ground. And I'd just look at that thing and I'd look over the left shoulder of that co-pilot and every bitch you're doing, I'd just look, oh, gone, it's gonna get off of that ground. Then all of a sudden it'd get airborne. The moment it lifted off the ground, the pilot would say wheels and the engineer had a switch, I guess, he'd to retract them wheels. And the moment those wheels started going up into the wing, it felt like the airplane was sinking, you know, optical illusion. Wheels going up, and I'd pick my feet up off the floor. <laughs> and then just so I'd get my feet picked up, and I'd set them back down, I'd see the pilot take one hand off of the wheel. He'd have both hands on that wheel. Then he'd reach over and touch the co-pilot, and he'd get them throttles. And he'd, he'd got up high enough, and he'd throttle it back. And at that particular moment, I could feel my rear end just relax. I guess I had it so tight. <laughs> but that, that was a typical takeoff, and then uh, by then it'd be daylight. You'd take off, uh, get out, get up out of the bed at about 2.30, 3 o'clock, and take off just as the sun was, well, the sun wouldn't be shining, and most of the times it'd just be a sunrise coming up somewhere. A typical B-17 takeoff. What was a typical B-17 takeoff like? Did they take as much uh, roll? No, that's what I, I don't, it didn't seem like it took that long. Of course, I wasn't up in the front. In the B-17, I had a little radio room go in the back door, and I'd go through the waist, which wasn't too far, go by the bomb, go by the ball turret, and sit down on the left hand, right on the left wing, and uh, just uh, look out a window right across the left wing, and I had a plexiglass dome up above me, and just sit down in your radio room. You didn't have anywhere to go. You went to your your place of battle or so speak, and you just sit there, and I couldn't see out. I could see the pilot through the bomb bays, and I could look up there and see him doing it, but I didn't have any reason up there. So I didn't see any takeoffs in a B-17 except out the window, and I didn't even really look for it. I could, like in a commercial airline today, you go down through there, you know when you get airborne, you feel it, you fly much, and you knew it was gonna take off, and didn't think nothing about it. But it didn't seem like it took as long in a B-17. It might have, but when you're looking at the end of the runway and you're in a B-24, and it just seemed like it took longer. Whether it did or not, I'm not familiar, but it, I believe the B-17 took off faster. I had a, a fairly comfortable seat, but I had a comfortable seat in the B-24, but I did have to come back and stand in the waist. And the B-17, I sit in my radio seat all the time until maybe just step back three or four steps and man the waist gun if I had to man it. But I can't remember doing anything, just 
get up and walk a step or two and look out a window and watch and try to help the pilot. The removal of the B-17's dorsal machine gun. At one point in the B-17 above you, you had a, a gun. Do you recall why they took that out? No, I sure don't. I guess it's because uh, their superiority probably. I don't, I don't know. Well, I just went one day and it wasn't there. I remember being there and it had a, I had to go to the armament shack. If you had a gun position, you go to the armament shack and when you got to the airplane, got things set up, go over there and get your 50 caliber machine gun, lay it across your shoulder, bring it and insert it into that gun. I don't believe I ever had to insert one in that. I believe it was already inserted. But my waist gun in the 24, I used to go get it. In the 17, get the, the 50 cal machine gun out of the rack, put it in that rack that they had in the airplane. And I don't know when they took it out and why, but it probably because uh, not too much fighters attacking you or something. I, mm -hmm. I wasn't in that upper echelon to know them things. <laughs> um, can you describe what a 50 caliber gun could do, what a what a slug looked like, and, and what kind of damage a 50 caliber could do? No, you, you don't I, I sure can't, but it's just a pretty good sized bullet. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I never seen where one hit. So yeah. Jim's wounded in action story. After all this thing, I got a purple heart for it, but I, I just, I get to reminiscing about what happened to me as a kid. When I was 13 years old, they said I had sinus trouble. And they went up in my head and operated on my nose. And I went into a coma and stayed in a coma for eight days. And they said that my sinus had swelled up. I don't know what that is. Back then, it was in 1938 or 39. And then after I was pronounced probably dead, they thought of dead, I come out of that coma. And a week or two after that, while I was recuperating at home, I was walking up the street and I had a, a seizure or something, fell over. And they said that's just after effects of that uh, thing there. So I didn't pay any attention to it. It just passed away. Never had it again. And then I actually believe on June the 14th, 1944, that I was in the waste in the waste gun and on a mission. I can't remember the name of the target on him. I probably could look it up. And all of a sudden, I was laying in the waste of the airplane. And the ball turret gunner was with me and the bombardier had come back there. Now, see, I must have been out a little while because they had time to get to me. And they were had my oxygen mask putting on my face. And they said, are you hit? And well, my shoulder was hurting. I said, I think so. And, but I found out I wasn't. And then I found out it was just my shoulder. I had a trick shoulder that I'd hurt in football or baseball or something like that. It got out a time or two, but it always go back in. I couldn't get it back in, I told them. So when we come back and landed, it was figured that I fell in the airplane, got I might have. Might, it might have been a flak that knocked us, and I might have grabbed and got my shoulder out of place. But after looking back at it, I believe I must have had a seizure and fell because I had to be out a long time. Or I don't know. And I don't know what I was doing down there. But anyway, that soul shoulder was knocked out of place, and they couldn't get it back in. They had to take me to the hospital and work on it and cast it up, and got it back in some way. And I stayed in the hospital about three or four weeks. And uh, it was wounded in action, what they said. But I believe I had one of them spells mm -hmm. that I'd had in 1938 or 39. And this was 44. Jim's hospital and physical therapy story. Well, they took care of it good. I went over there with a taped up arm to my side. Uh, I didn't know who the doctor was or anything, but they wanted to immediately, after x-raying, they wanted to cut in my shoulder and put pins in it. And I said, no, don't cut in there. It'll go back in. It's back in now. I don't know, but it just seems like I made that doctor mad. I believe he wanted to, 
I believe he won't do it. I don't know. But anyway, he said, put him down and cast him up, put a cast on him. And they cast me from my waist up to my neck, prop my arm up in the air, put a brace under it, cast that all the way out to the end of my fingers and cut a hole round about where my navel was at and told me to go back to the war. Now, I had on a suit of armor and had to walk back up the hallway in this little 65th General Hospital. And you know, it wasn't far, but it was too far up there. But I went back to the ward and I was hurting. A young boy with a shoulder been out of place and they had it all cast up and I was in bad shape and I wanted something to ease the pain, but the medic wouldn't give me it. said the doctor hadn't said anything. I begged him and he wouldn't give me that to ease the pain. So I got out walking around a little corner, not too far from that little place I was supposed to be, and I'd look and nobody walking along. I'd stop and cry a little bit, like a little baby from home. <laughs> and out away from home, I want my mama, I guess. <laughs> but then when I got back, he said the doctor was mad at you. He said he would come back by here and want to see you. I said, what did he say? He said, didn't say nothing. He was just mad. He left. And far as I know, the next morning when he come in, he just took my chart. I you know, stood up. I was a bed patient, but I could stand up when the doctor come in. You're supposed to stand up when the officer comes in, I guess. And he just looked at that pad, and he told that ward boy, put this soldier out there in a tent. And as far as I know, every morning when he come by, it could have been other doctors, I don't know, but they never did speak to him, just look at that chart. And I guess that's what they're supposed to do, look at the chart, see how, how long you've been in. Then one day he said, send him down to orthopedic and get it cut off. That was about three or four weeks. Go down there and they sawed it off. And I like to never got that little arm down out of the air. <laughs> when I did pull it down, they had to put the smelling sauce to <laughs> wake me up. But they started physical therapy and got it all fixed up and got it back. And I went back and asked the pilot, uh, Lieutenant Marvin Orleans, about getting back on there. Was I still on the crew? He said, you sure are. As quick as the doctor turns you loose. So I went to the doctor. And I said, how, how am I going to get back to flying? I mean, he said, that's another crazy fellow. I want to get back in that air. I thought you were supposed to because I was a member of that crew. And he said, can you Indian wrestle? And I said, yeah. He said, well, put my arm down. And well, put, I believe he let me put it down, you know, just right quick. He put me on flying status, and I took it back to my first sergeant North Carter or Ace of Phelps or somebody. Next day, I was back on that crew of flying. Mm -hmm. So they gave me good treatment, especially the young lieutenant lady, a nurse, she really did know her physical therapy. I don't know her, and she was rather an attractive girl. And me, a 19-year-old boy, she was an older than me, but she was attractive, and she, I believe she's a first lieutenant. She is an officer, and she really knew her physical therapy. And for the four or five times going to morning and afternoon, and those fingers rubbing over me, and me, a 19-year-old boy, and a good-looking woman are rubbing on you. <laughs> But she was good till one day I went, one morning went up there and they had a soldier. He was started rubbing on me. He was training to be a physical therapist. And I think I must have asked him about going back to the outfit because I, I, he didn't rub like that that young nurse did. <laughs> she had a, a modest touch, is that what you call it? Mm -hmm. The importance of teamwork on a bomber crew. All I could ever see, everybody did their job. You knew where the other man was at. Uh, it wasn't horsing around on the airplane. It just everybody was at his position. And they would talk to you over the intercom sometime if you want to know something. But everybody did his, just did his specific job, such as the tail gunner stayed back there in his position. And uh, I sat in the radio room. And if you just look, that's what you had to do is observe out those windows, look for anything to happen and to notify that pilot for anything I'm out. That's, that's the first thing you're supposed to do is push that button and tell that pilot if you've seen anything out of the ordinary. Is, and as far as I know, everybody did their job and, and you didn't have to do somebody else's job. And we were lucky, no one ever got hurt as far as having to take over somebody else's job. 
We never did get shot up so bad that had to improvise and do things. So we were really, I guess, a lucky crew. You take uh, flying the missions we did and never getting anything bad. Some one time we had some engines mess up and we lost altitude and almost had to bail out, but we didn't and come back, got down low and come back to England and the German fighters didn't touch us. We were a wounded victim, but we didn't get, they didn't bother us. Straggler dangers and protocols. Well, we had thoughts of it. They had told us about it, that you were a sitting duck and you get down there by yourself and that's what they wanted, just like a wounded rabbit. If you're out rabbit hunting and you wound him a little bit, he was he was yours. And I was always told that uh, when you get out like that, if you thought you couldn't make it and the German fighters start in on you, you could drop your wheels. And that was a sign of surrender. And they would lead you to the nearest air base. And by you'd get there, they used to tell us about destroying all secret things such as your radio codes and your bomb site, anything that you could destroy before you got there. That was legal within the rules of war, I imagine. And that's what they told us to do. But that one time that we were like that, that's all I remember, uh, no one attacked us. We got back to England. I can't remember where others got with us or what, but I do remember we we're all ganged around, the, this was in 20, B-24, we all were ganged around the back hatch. The bombardier was back there, everybody was back there except the pilot and the co-pilot, waiting on him to tell us to get out. We were going out of that thing. But something happened and didn't, and so they never did touch us, but that was a sign if you dropped your wheels, uh, you were surrendered, and they would lead you to an airport. Now, I've been told that that's what it do. I, I was told that there was one bomb group, I was, you know, how you hear stories about the hundred, I believe they called it, that some pilot was in that predicament and told his gunners to get the, in the get their guns and aimed right at the at fighter was sitting out there with him. He said, if you're riding along at 200 mile an hour, both of you, it's like you're sitting side to side. And all of a sudden he gave the word to fire. But I believe that somebody, they shot him down, but I believe he notified somebody what happened. Or, because they used to call it, I believe they called it the Bloody Hundred. It wasn't too far from us. And I've been over there with a boy who was in my outfit and had a cousin or something. We rode bicycle over their place. But I was told that they, every time they'd go on a mission, those Germans knew where they was at and they were after them buggers. My outfit was very fortunate and never, when I was in there, and say it took us from May the 31st to January the 10th or something to fly 30 missions, uh, taking out the month of December. The month of December was a, a radio relay ship for the 3rd Division. They took a B-17 and cleaned all the bomb bays out and put all kind of radio equipment, all kind of channels, bomber to bomber, bomber to fighter, fighter to ground, everything you had in that. And we acted as a relay station. And we flew every day that there was ever a 8th Air, uh, 3rd Division airplane going to be in the air, regardless where we was at. We'd leave home and maybe air base and maybe get back two days later. Couldn't get in, bad weather. And December in England is rough. And we were volunteering, somebody volunteered for us for that mission. I remember it was in November, first, last part of it, uh, a Jeep, we go on a little training mission or something, the Jeep come out there, the pilot, co-pilot, radio operating engineer. When the Jeep approached the crew, Jim thought he and his pal were in trouble. I said, right quick, like a kid, you know, you tell a little fib, uh, uh, that's the first line of defense. I done nothing. He asked my engineer, Buck Miss, he said, what you done, Buck? And I done nothing. I got to think about the time we was in London, how we'd cut up. And I remember one time Buck was, he had really laid a good whack on an English man that worked in a hotel. He'd run some old English 
battering at us and made him made Buck a little mad and Buck didn't like the way he talked to us and he slapped him and we started we run down that hotel and he got out on the streets and after we was running up the street and go, going down them alleys you heard them little whistles them bobbies blowed we thought they was hunting us you know that's the way they give signals back but nobody ever said anything to us so I've thought about that and I said they found out about that we'd be in Buck just sat there behind the pilot he was up in the front we in the back but we never did admit to anything. We got over there and they took us in a room and uh, had some officers in there and they closed the door. And we sat down and they told my pilot, Lieutenant Marvin Orlean, says, you, your crew has been selected to fly a relay radio ship, a radio relay ship or whatever they called it, and uh, through the month of December. And we were just about had about one more mission to go for 30, something like that. And we was going to thought we was coming home, but they had upped it to 35 a week or two or four before. And everybody was mad about that. And we flew that thing for the month of December. Then we come back in uh, January and flew one or maybe two in the pilot, co-pilot, engineer, ball turret gunner, tail gunner, and the nose gunner had all finished. I was the only one that didn't have enough missions. I'd miss doing that little stay in the hospital. Now that was a problem. That was hurt when you watched them. I'd been with them since November of 1943. We were a crew that stayed together from November 1943 until January, mid-January 1945, and stayed together. No one had had to leave a little while with me with that injury. Of course, we had some navigators that left us, but. The pilot, co-pilot, engineer, radio operator, ball turret gunner, nose gunner, waist gunner, and tail gunner stayed together the whole entire time. And our second bombardier joined us when we got overseas, and he was with us all the time of all that combat flying. No one got a scratch. Didn't have to shoot at a German plane nowhere. Nothing happened to us. So the old saying that tell me that uh, somebody up there must have been looking after you and play, made plenty of money. I'd never had the kind of money I had then. The tech sergeant rating, time and a half, just money. Uh, I found out later that they paid you that good money because they knew you wasn't going to collect it. Because the life expectancy, now that I read the books, the life expectancy of an air crew member was very little. I didn't know that back then. It didn't make a risk to me. There wasn't nobody going to get rid of me. I wasn't ready to go then. Mm -hmm. But uh, really and truthfully, I, I don't ever remember thinking about uh, leaving this old world. I, I guess that's where a 19-year-old boy is supposed to think, especially when he just growed up and didn't ever have anything, no money, had a little job of fooling around, going to high school, playing athletics. Assisting the ball turret gunner. I didn't ever have to help him get in and out. I probably was told how to do it. I remember we used to practice a cranking that thing up or cranking it around. And and I probably had responsibilities to look in for him, look out for him if something happened. Because things could happen. I I asked him to let me get out in it one time. And I was a little bigger than him. He was a little bit boy, but I could I was slim, a little not too much taller. And I got down in it. I wanted to get down and see how it felt to ride in that thing. And we was, I guess, a, probably a practice mission. And I got down in that thing, and I did fill it up more than he did. And laying there, and the gun sight was right between your feet. And pull down the top hatches and use the gun sight or something to, like a bulldozer, I imagine, as far as I remember, how you turned it and looked around. And I rolled around in it and looked at the ground and back up and all the then I decided I wanted to get out. And I turned it with the gun straight down. I believe that's the way you got out, or I can't remember that. But I turned it the way you're supposed to get out. And I reached up to unlatch the hatch. And it wouldn't unlock. And I believe I got a little claustrophobia, is that the name of the word? I was ready to tear that place up. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I wasn't thinking about intercom or talking to anybody. I did hit a few times on something and they probably didn't hear me. And I looked and I got to reading and it says 
in little red letters said line up arrows before opening to open line arrows up and I put them arrows and got them lined up <coughs> and I opened that door and I climbed out of that ball turret and they, from then on I'd step by it, go around it, see it was on my way to the radio room right there in the waist. But I never got back in it. But I undoubtedly had procedures to get him out of there because I do remember practicing cranking it. I don't know where to crank the B-17s up, but they mm -hmm. had a crank on where you could crank it certain ways mm -hmm. manually as we did the wheels and the other things you had cranks. We all practiced on them. Ditching practice. They used to practice ditching. Uh, we'd uh, even practice that over land, but the pilot would just get us all back in the back of the plane, and him and the co-pilot, I believe, was all the stuff there. The engineer might stay, but I believe it was all up there. Just that was all up there. And what little bulkhead there was behind the Bombay, everybody'd sit down in the floor, and uh, on whatever both sides, and sit between each other's legs and hold each other around the waist. And there was procedures of knowing where the just quick as it hit, how long it'd take you to get out, and the B-24 would sink very quickly, I think more so in the B-17, and go through practice those things sometime on practice flight. It was, I believe it was the pilot's responsibility to practice them and log them down so the headquarters would know that he had practice them. And everybody would go through the same procedure of what he's supposed to do, and how you're supposed to get out, where you escape hatches, how to get out, how to get that dinghy out of that wing or wherever it come from, and how to inflate your Mae West, and just go through them. But we never did touch the ground, never did have to ditch. The value of ditching practice. Well, at that time, yeah, you thought you could do it, right? And now then, I don't, I look back at it, I don't know where I could or not, but back then, I was sure that what they was teaching us, I would have responded to what they said. And just like getting on a commercial airplane today, they read it off to you, but you don't pay any attention to them. But back then, you paid attention, or you thought you did, and you fully realized, I was confident I knowed which way to go. Because when I got on an airplane in the 24, especially I threw my parachute down in the floor at the waist gun, and I went through the Bombay and flew in the radio compartment. Now, I never did. My parachute was back there. I knew I could get to it. But now that I have to see him going down sometime, I don't know where I could have got to it or not. And a B-17, I carried it with me, my little chest pack, and laid it on top of my radio receiver. It was right up there. But if something happened, it fell off in the floor. And I might have not known where it, well, I guess you, you had confidence you knew where it was at so you could snap it on when you had to. Things squadron mates go down. I have never seen but one that looked like it was on fire that went off in the clouds and they started bailing out of it. And that's, I seen one that was, somebody said that was a plane going all the way down and he was, we were going into some of them little inlets up of Norway or above Belgium or somewhere, them little straits where we went into Germany that way, they told us there wasn't much gun in place for us. But there was a B-17 and something happened to it and it was, we was at 20, 23 or 25,000 feet and they must have been down around six or 7,000 feet. They was real low. And everybody was watching it and somebody says up front and we caught up with it. And I looked out my little window on the left wing and I looked down and I seen that B-17 it might have been uh, seven, eight thousand feet, but it was down, and you could see them water inlets. Down there. And after a while, three or four little parachutes come out of it. And then all of a sudden, I, you, just before we got out of sight, somebody said they've jumped out of it. And I looked, and it looked like you could see splashes in the water about that time. Then it looked like the plane started gaining altitude, but we went on off and left it. And I always imagined them boys that jumped out was looking, and there it went. Said, so, no, we left too quick <laughs> to go in. But I don't know what happened to it, but that's the only one I've seen. And uh, when I was in the hospital, 
they told me that the Lieutenant Fellows, Richard Fellows crew of the 851st Bomb Squadron, got a direct hit. And some of the gunners said it all happened so fast, blowed him up, the B-24 has exploded, and debris was falling, but it was over in split seconds. And you looking where else were, and just as it goes. So, but as far as seeing one exact, I, I never did see one go down and spinning around. I just never did. Jim's thoughts regarding getting out of the radio compartment in an emergency. Back then, I thought I could. Now then, in reading these books, World War II books and things, I can't comprehend how anybody got to those places. You had places you'd go out. Crawl and go out to Bombay. It was right up at the front of you. Go back and go out one of the waste windows or go out the side door. It wasn't too far away, maybe three or four feet, five. But I just wonder if that plane uh, was flipping and flopping, but it might have not done it. It might have come down pancaking. But uh, at that particular time, I was confident I knowed how to get out of it. But I didn't think much about it because, as far as I remember, because I know that wasn't nothing going to happen to me. I was immortal. <laughs> Bad to be when you're 19. Jim's thoughts regarding feelings of fear. I don't remember being afraid. I guess you'd be, I've heard of a word called apprehensive. Is that what you call it? Uh, at, at different times, my body would react to certain things such as flacca popping and you'd probably have a little queasiness in you because when it was over, you'd feel a little different. But being afraid as far as being in terror, holy terror, I can't comprehend or don't ever remember being completely scared. I remember the only thing that used to get me mostly was sometime we'd come in and the undercast would be below us. And maybe you'd have six or eight, 12 airplanes. And you had a undercast of maybe five or 6,000 feet and a thousand foot ceiling below. And rather than come across the channel with a thousand feet ceiling, you'd come in above it. And you'd have to peel off and go down in that stuff. And the pilot knew what he was supposed to do. It's so many come down so many feet per second so fast in a certain degree of coming down and the plane behind him doing the same thing and the plane in front of him. And you had to look out the windows and if you looked out the balcony window this morning toward that Savannah River, you couldn't see any, you couldn't see no, you couldn't see as far as you, I'm looking. That's the way it was in them clouds. And you wondered what was above you and you're listening and looking for anything to tell that pilot. And I can still remember that feeling of coming through there, and it seemed like eternity. It would. It just seemed like you'd never get out of it. And then all of a sudden, you'd bust out into the clear air, and the ground would be look like it's right on you, but it'd be a thousand feet below. And then you'd get out in the rat race trying to get on the runway, such as planes are coming in, and you're having to make your approach, and something happening blow you off course, a prop wash and knock you, you have to make another trip around, pilot raising cane about being low on gas and getting, but that coming down through them clouds with other planes coming in in front of you and behind you peeling off and you wonder what they're doing. That was the only thing, but being a really afraid, I can't ever remember being afraid, just mm -hmm. thinking about it. Using the ADF or automatic direction finder radio, I used to have a box that I could, I'd send out a signal, seemed like on low frequency with a trailing wire antenna. Yeah. And I had a little thing I could pick up a radio station, two or three, three points, and flip a switch and it'd give a reading on a dial, and I could draw that triangle and I could pinpoint just about where it was at. But it was a, some kind of a low frequency thing, I believe. But I, I knew how to work it back in radio school, and I've worked it on the airplane, you know, flying around in Idaho with those stations just to see if I knew where we was at. But 
Now, did you work with a navigator when you were doing that? No, I don't remember doing anything with a navigator except listen to him and synchronize my watch with his when he called back and then when he'd tell me to th throw out that shaft, I'd, I'd the right point. Jim's last mission. My crew, the Orleans crew, had already finished. As I say, I needed more missions. Mm -hmm. And I needed a crew, I guess, because somebody put me on a crew of Captain Ken Cavanaugh. And he was sort of a celebrity before we went into war. He was a professional football player, Chicago Bears, and well known for him, and a big boy. If you ever see him, he's here today. He's eight foot tall and looks like a, he's a big fella. But anyway, I was flying with him, and I probably knew it was his last mission. Uh, because we flew on the mission, I don't remember where we went. Well, when we come back, they was out there with uh, photographers to take his picture. And I was in his crew picture. I flew my last, the last four missions I flew was with him. And with Ken Cavanaugh crew. And they, I got on the old truck like always, went up, put up my parachute and harness. Then all of a sudden, I don't remember anything. The next thing I remember, I was in the hospital. And I looked up and the doctor said, well, Everhart, you're flying days and over. And I wonder what was wrong. So I get back to that passing out, that seizure. He said, you had a seizure. Now this was February the 23rd, 1944. I believe on June the 14th, 1944, I had one today, because I know I had one on in 1938 or 39. But see, I had to been out. The boys told me later on that I just dropped over going in the interrogation room, and I don't. It took a long time for the ambulance to get me to take me to the hospital. When I opened my eyes, I was completely cured right then. Wasn't nothing wrong with me. And he told me I had a, a symptoms of epilepsy, that my right cheek quivered and I'd urinated on myself. I didn't know what I'd done. I didn't, wasn't nothing wrong with me then, I was pure. But they ground me and started through the hospital procedures and finally told me I'd had meningitis or encephalitis when I was young. I suppose I died, but I didn't. And I believe that was, that was the last, never had one since then, I'm 73 now. The intense cold at combat altitude In training, there wasn't another thing to do with it. Now, nothing but uh, sheepskin clothing. Mm -hmm. But we didn't fly too high. Very seldom we go on oxygen. I don't know of many times, if any, while we was training in Mountain Home, Idaho, that we went high enough that you had to use oxygen. We had oxygen masks and practice on it. But it had to have been in January, February, something like that, of March of 1944 that. As I understand, each crew was supposed to check out at 30,000 feet. That was what was I remember them telling us. And had the sheepskin clothing, and had good heaters on the plane. They had to heat the plane down on the ground real good. And we had to, all, everybody was on the airplane, we had to climb to 30,000 feet. And it had to be logged down by the pilot. And it took a long time to get to 30,000 feet. I don't know how long it took, but you don't, do like the jets do today, go there in a few minutes or a minute. We had to gradually circle and climb, and before we got up to 20,000 feet, it had to been, oh, I don't know how cold it was. They said sometime it'd get 50 and 60 below zero, but I just had on sheepskin clothing, and I finally stood up out of the radio seat, stood beside the engineer, and the pilot and co-pilot sitting there, and all everybody had on big gloves, had your goggles pulled down watching that altimeter. All the others, the bombardier and maybe the navigator, they was at their stations, just froze to death. The heaters were going full blast, but they wasn't a cold, wasn't warming up nothing. And we kept waiting on that altimeter to get to 30,000. And when it got there, we were supposed to stay a certain amount of time. Whether we did, I don't know. I was so froze. I don't know where I've ever been so cold or not. And we started coming down. But when we got overseas, they issued us heated suits. And the only thing I can remember about the cold weather when it was cold is when you're young and you you probably have to edit this, but 
you want to take a leak and you're young and you're warm inside your heated suit and a young man he's raring to go along about then and you think you can do everything so you pull off your big old glove and you got your little silk glove on up there and you unbutton your fly didn't have zippers I don't believe we had zippers and then you reach in to get out that water spout and that's when you feel like it's it's 60 below zero you had that little old relief tube and you got a lots of hot fluid in you but that stuff would start coming out and it'd start freezing when it'd get in that old relief tube and it'd splatter all over your bridges and you couldn't wait to get that thing back in there where it's warm and button up and get that glove back on then you'd have ice on you it was made out of salt salt water you know but that's how cold it was that when you you wouldn't realize it when you opened up that fly at 60 below zero and you you realized how cold it was so you didn't do that much you just sat on that little stopper and hold it you got down low maybe use that relief too but I tried it one time up high and I guess maybe one time and I had sense enough not to do it more. Because you'd sit there and you, the breath would come out of your uh, side of your oxygen mask and freeze on your shoulder. Just sit in one spot, breathing good and warm in that heated suit. But I do remember turning that heated suit down. They had a 24 volt system somewhere and had a little uh, dial on it and turned up get warm. When the flat would start popping, I'm, I have remembered turning that thing down. I, I guess I was hot. Yet I probably was perspiring because of that flat, but I do remember turning it down. I'd get so hot, so that was probably being scared too, but I wouldn't. The emergency landing in front of their taxiing B-17. I don't, I don't know whose it was. I think it was the fellow that you interviewed before, but I, I don't know who he was. Uh, we was on a, I guess, going out on a practice mission, or I don't know what it was, but we had to all be there. We was going down the perimeter track, going around to the end of the runway, going to take off. I remember we was going to turn right and take off uh, from downwind, and we pulled up to the perimeter track, and I was listening to the pilot talk to the, and I was to be 17 in over on the left wing, and we was going to turn and go that go to the right instead of. I, and they, the tire told them, said, "Hold up, hold up, we got a uh, merge coming in landing." Well, I was sat there and I kept looking out the left wing, and that's the way you're going to land. You land the way you take off. And I just kept looking, and I wonder when the devil was he going to get inside. I didn't see nothing. All of a sudden, I heard the tire talking to the pilot of that plane. Pull that thing off. Get it off in the grass. Get that thing stopped. And by then somebody said, look yonder. And it was coming the other way. It landed downwind. It's coming toward us. We was parked on the end of the perimeter track, back away from the runway quite a bit. But here he come and it was on fire and the fire trucks was after <laughs> The pilot hollered, get out of this place. Everybody just unplugged and went to the, I went out the back door and Everybody just got out of our airplane because it pulled right up in front of us. wasn't too far. I guess it's a good distance, but it looked close. When I left that plane, and I went and found me a gully somewhere off the end of the perimeter, and got down that gully and looked back. And when I looked back at it, they was firemen all around it, spraying that white stuff. And but it landed the wrong way. He it, he come in. He got on the ground the best he could. And I never did know who it was to one of these reunions that. I can't pronounce that boy's name. I, I tell him I can't pronounce it. It's that fellow we've seen a while ago, Guaglianio or something like that. It's, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> but he told us his plan. Mm -hmm. and, but it, that was just a, a thing that happened. Them pilots would put, that old plane would just do anything. It just, it, you couldn't hardly knock it out of there. It didn't fly on, I bet it'd fly on one engine. I don't know. I bet they could keep it up there a while on it. The B-24 versus the B-17, Jim's thoughts. I don't think it'd make any difference in combat. What I liked about the B-24 was it had plenty of room in it. I could walk around in it, get around in it good. I didn't have to get around in it, but I have been up in the nose on takeoffs. 
I wasn't supposed to, but I went up and tried it. You know, a young boy, I sat in the nose, because you get up through the tunnel up in the nose real easy. And to be 24, it seemed like you could move around, had a little more head space. But uh, the B-17, just, I believe it was better taken off. I had a more comfortable headquarters, but it was all the same in combat. So I, they both were real good planes to me. I, uh, I wouldn't, the only thing I'd say about the B-17 is my immediate position as a radio operator had a little better, well, it wasn't any better seat, but I was in a little place of my own, and and that seemed like it'd take off easier. And by the reports from other folks, it, it wouldn't blow up as quick, but it, I seen evidence it would blow up too. But they claim the B-24 would explode in mid-air lots more, easier. But I, well, I couldn't prove that. But as far as comparing one to the other, uh, I, they both were just equivalent to what they're supposed to do to me. Like my co-pilot, he was favorable to the B-24 because he liked the way the engines, ha where they handled it, and the way he felt it in that uh, cockpit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he liked B-17s too. But I, I just, uh, by hearing people talk, and the B-17 was more durable, and I guess I was thinking that too, but it didn't make any difference. If that flak hit it in the right place, it'd go. Mm -hmm. But so I just say they're both real good heavy bombers of their day. The attribution to his survival of the war. I don't know, unless it's that man upstairs. That I, I just I can't pinpoint anything. I guess it's it might be the old saying the young the good die young. The only boy that I know of that, that that was real close as far as being close was on another crew. It was right always with us when we was trained at Mountain Home and overseas. His name was John Volan. He come from Pittsfield, Massachusetts. I believe he was a devout Catholic, I don't know. I don't ever remember him drinking or getting rowdy like GI will do. I believe he did start smoking a pipe. He was the one that I never have forgot when I was telling you prior to this cussing when they'd get you out of bed every morning, staggering across an old sugar beet field or what are you doing, me using profanity against the Germans or CQs or anybody to wake you up. He was always saying, Everhart, why don't you shut up that nasty talk? And I'd lambast him every once in a while, but I, I didn't mean to, but I probably did. And he, he, on his, they were supposed to fly 30 missions and get through. And before he got to 30, they upped it to 35. I want to think that it was the 33rd mission. He was a tail gunner on Lieutenant George Reeves' crew. And there was a sort of an explosion right close to the tail and it damaged the airplane real bad. And I've heard from the pilot person, he said he thought he heard George, uh, John say oh, something like that. He don't know where he heard him over the intercom or what. He had the radio operator go back there, or the ball turret gunner, somebody go back and check on John. And he was sitting in the tail gunner, dead already. One piece of flak went between his uh, he had a flak suit on the front like a catcher's breast protector and down the back and there's a little gap underneath the arm where they went, and that one piece of flak went just a little flak went right through right through his heart and killed him instantly and so there was a good and I, I, we weren't flying that day and I, I never have forgot it I come back and they come back in the barracks and the enlisted men were crying John had got killed and, and we went to his funeral and they buried him in England and went through all the procedures of military procedures of saluting and things of that nature. And I was supposed to go see his mom and daddy after the war and I
kept putting it off till later, and I finally did later years, got in touch with his daddy. His mom had already dead, but his daddy was glad I got in touch with him. Jim's philosophy on war. First of all, is war don't settle anything. They're going to have them, and they always will, and always will. They never settle anything. They're not, they're mostly all political or religious. Uh, it's just a group of two people, might as well say, or groups of people, both of them wanting the same thing and neither want to compromise. And that's going to always happen as long as there's human beings in the world. Uh, you would have to do battle in your method of the day, regardless of what it was. Back in the caveman days, they battled with clubs, and, and our day come along. But our day uh, will never be again until the world changes, and I don't believe the caveman days will be again. And what they're doing right today with pushing buttons, we think right now that that's the only way to fight a battle with somebody sitting in a room uh, uh, 10,000 mile away push a button and destroy a target somewhere else. One button, one send something on the way. And uh, so try to compare one with the other. I don't think there's any way you do it. You just have to do battle with what you got in that particular day. I think the, the people of today would react to a war if it really got publicized and thought that somebody was threatening our own little domain that we would respond to it. The young men would respond to it just like we did in World War II and uh, my daddy did in World War I and my great grandfather did in the Civil War. You just, whatever happens in your day uh, I think that the young will have to do it. Jim's thoughts on the atomic bomb. It was just unbelievable to me, really. I was, in a way, glad it had happened. I was ready for it to end, I guess. I have feelings now that it could have been the best thing. It couldn't have been the best thing. But it's one of those things that happen and you can't do anything about it, so you have to accept it for what it done. You're sorry for the people that got hurt, but you're glad for the people that didn't get hurt. So one weighs as much as the other. Uh, at that particular time in 1945, I was, like with the most people, I was probably uh, having a hollering good time because it was over. Uh, I know the people on the receiving end was having a wailing time of cause it hurt somebody. But it had to come to an end and that was a method it's, that someone somewhere devised that had more authority or control than I do to try to put a stop to it and it did put a stop to it. But it didn't put a stop to war. It didn't take but four or five more years we're back in it again with cold rear. And that was, didn't solve a thing. Then come Vietnam and it don't solve a thing. The Gulf War ain't solved a thing. Nothing solves it. So, the only reactions I had when they dropped the atomic bomb was I said, well, that's good, the war's over now. That's about it. But the war was good. The best thing that ever happened this country, Hick, or Mill Village, Hick. It was really the best. One of the best things ever happened to me because I didn't get hurt, met people, seen things. You wouldn't believe it, I'd never used a commode. I hadn't. I had an outside toilet, wouldn't hardly use it. I'd go to the woods. They had a commode in the high school downstairs where I used to slip and smoke a cigarette and throw the butt in. <laughs> I'd never use it. And never used a telephone, didn't, know, didn't have one. Didn't have any use to use one. Till I got in the army and used a telephone, a fella showed me how to send a money order home. I'd never heard of a money order, a telegram. I'd heard of maybe in the movies a telegram, but I'd never used it. All I'd done is raised up, try to work a little bit around home, play high school athletics. My daddy fed me good, made me wear clothes, tried to be good to my neighbor. 
Got 18 years old, the war's going on. I went to the draft board and asked them to take me in the Army right then. They took me, they'd wait uh, six to eight months after you was 18 before they'd bother you, but they got me. I went down a week after I was 18 and they took me the next week. There was another good thing. I went in six months before I was supposed to. If I hadn't went in, no telling where I'd went. If I stayed at Miami Beach as a drill instructor, I'd have walked out on College Avenue and got run over with a truck. I didn't stay there. Just wherever I went, everything worked out just mm -hmm. fine. But just so war was just war, and they'll have them tomorrow, and they'll have them the week after next. And if anybody can ever show to me where one of them helped solve any real, really solved any problem. I'd love to see that answer somewhere because I don't believe war ever solves, really solves any problem. Big Jim Everhart passed away on May 14, 2011 at the age of 86. His honest and humble story lives on here at Air Combat Journal. If you enjoyed this show and would like to see more like it, please subscribe to this channel and click on the like button. Subscribing will encourage me to get more of my 200 interviews out, as well as will improve my YouTube analytics.